love for you to open up your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5 this morning. Go to Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to get to it in a few moments. We are, uh, we are studying, starting our new series. We just came out of the series on Yahweh. And if you did not get to hear that Yahweh series, please go to YouTube and go check that out. Because to me that was such a good series on the names of God. I didn't know how many names God had. We, we actually had to end. We couldn't keep on going because there's so many more names that he has. They're powerful names. They're names that make a difference. If you've got something you're going through, there's a name for that. God's got a name for that. So if you need healing, he is Jehovah Rapha. There's a name for that. If you need peace, he is Jehovah Shalom. There's a name for that. And we realize that God has different names. But also today, as we are heading up into Easter, I believe that this is, could be the, one of the most incredible Easter's of all time because of what's happening. I see the church going through a growth spurt. It's like your, you know, your 13-year-old son who's only five foot two, and over the summer he ate a lot, slept a lot. You didn't wake him up a lot. Boom, and now he's five foot nine. You know what I'm talking about? I feel like the church is going through a growth spurt at this time. But when I began to look at what was the prophetically the word that God wanted for our church. And for all of Inspire locations to realize what is the, what series are we going to do? What are we going to study in the Bible together? That was really important. If we were to go back three years ago, we've got a rhythm to what we preach. We've got family. We've got finances. We'll get to family. We'll get to finances. We would go through evangelism, all of that pre-2020. But now we've gone through 2021, and now we're in 2022. It's a different kind of church. It's a different kind of believer. It's a little bit more, we're a lot more resilient than we were before in the midst of fragility. We are pushing forward the envelope. We are g going up to the edge of the cliff at times. But I wanted to preach a message that helped us realize that we actually have the ability to affect the state of Hawaii. Not just, not inspired church is going to affect the state of Hawaii. Believers can affect the state of Hawaii. And, and, and in great positive ways. As a matter of fact, Proverbs 11.10 says, when the righteous prosper, the city rejoices. When the righteous prosper, the city rejoices. When, the, when not the self-righteous, not the high and mighty, but when the righteous believers of God, you and me, who are walking out our faith, the city rejoices. I'd love to see the city rejoice again. I'd love to see the state rejoice again. We haven't rejoiced in a, in, a, in a bit, but what role do we play in allowing the city to rejoice? We play a huge role. You know, um, it's March Madness. Come on, I haven't watched enough basketball games. You know me. I should have a rim here. I should have a basketball backboard. I should be taking some free throws. But anyway, um, it's March Madness. And you know what? You and I are called saints. We are saints. You may not think that you're saintly, you may not think that you qualify as a saint. And if in, in another denomination, which I totally respect, you would, you would, in order to be a saint, you would have to be dead for five years and two confirmed miracles. You'd have to have that. And then you could be canonized as a saint if you made it through the process. Praise God for Father Damien who uh, sacrificed his life and went to Kalaupapa to minister to all of the people with leprosy in the late 1800s. I mean, that man was a saint. Let's come on, let's, let's, let's agree with that. He was a saint. But I also want you to know that you don't have to die and you don't have to be canonized to, cons to be considered a saint. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul called the believers saints. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, and to those who are sanctified or set apart in Christ, that's what that fancy word means, set apart in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. Saints. Everybody say saints. Called to be saints. We are the saints. We are the saints. We are the saints. Doesn't mean we're going to levitate. Doesn't mean we're going to, there's going to be an automatic halo over our head. I can see a halo. We're not going to, that, that's not going to happen. But what's going to happen is you and I, when we live out our faith as saints of God, something happens to the city. Oh, I'm preaching better than you're responding today. I know it's spring break, but don't take a break on me today. Think about this for a moment. The saints of God, you and I, we are saints. Now think about this. When I used to work for American Airlines back in the day, and I love American Airlines, I worked there for 12 years. I got hired at the age of 19, the youngest guy on the ramp at American. I thank God for Derek Grubb. I thank God for Larry Frank that took a chance on me. And uh, I brought in this young kid. I was 19. I didn't know Jesus uh, as my Lord and my Savior. had a head knowledge, never went to my heart. 
Uh, I, I, I could recite things, but I could, it, it, but it was from here. It never really was from here at that moment in my life because maybe I didn't want it to. I just didn't, I wanted to live my life. But for that two years, good luck with that, Mike. That, how'd that work out for you? Not so hot. Because then by the time that I'm 19 years old, I'm still working at American Airlines. DC Mike before that, um, now I'm 21, and now I give my life to Jesus because I've become a young single father by then, raising my daughter, not knowing the Lord, but owning up to my responsibility, Honolulu Mililani. Think about this for a moment. And it is in this time that I have a transition from a BC a pre-Christ life to now I am... I'm a new creation. I'm following Jesus. I'm trying to work that out. What does that feel like with my boys at work, with my friends at work? What does it feel like? What is, how do I work that out with now that I am now a Christian? That was difficult for me. I know a lot of us might be in that predicament right now, that you gave your life to Jesus this year, and now your friends at work going, okay, now you can't come out with us, and now you, there's a lot of things that you don't do anymore, and we miss the old you, and they're going to test your faith, they're going to press a button, they're going to bring a little temptation, they're going to try and pull you back with them, because they, they love you and they miss you. But this is where your testing really begins to meet the road. The rubber meets the road. It is in these times. And I remember at that time, I was, at, I was on a plane stuck in Hilo. I couldn't get out of Hilo. Some of you heard the story, but a lot of people are brand new, so I'm going to tell the story again, okay? It's kind of like a love song. You don't hear a love song one time, right? You play it over, you got it on replay. You play it over and over again, or you bring it back. And so what happened was I'm stuck at, uh, at this airline, and I couldn't get out. And then so basically I started talking to this, this young lady, um, and I said, so what do you do? She goes, oh, I'm a flight attendant. Oh, what are you doing in Hawaii? She goes, my father helped Pastor Wayne Cordero start his first church in Hilo. I was like, wow, that's, that's awesome. Wayne Cordero, Pastor Wayne Cordero was already blowing it up in Hilo before he came to Oahu. So he was like a legend. We were, everybody just wanted to hear what he had to say. So your dad is Noel? Noel? He says, that's my dad. I said, that's awesome. I said, so she goes, so what do you do? I said, oh, I'm just on the ramp. And I said, what do you do? She's on flight attendant. I said, for who? She goes, for American Airlines. I said, I'm a, I'm a, I work for American. I'm on the ramp. She goes, you're on the ramp? Yeah, yeah, I'm on the ramp. She goes, what do you mean? You're on the ramp for, wait, wait, wait. She goes, you're not just on the ramp. You're on the ramp for Jesus. And I said, like, wait, 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 hold on. Say that again? Yes, you represent Jesus, Mike. You work on the ramp for Jesus. You're not there for Ralph Crandall. You're not there for American Airlines. You are there for Jesus. You work for Jesus. And I said to her, I said, so do you work for Jesus as a flight attendant? She goes, yes, I do. I said, how's that possible? No, I'm just kidding. Anyway, <laughs> I didn't say that. I'm just joking on my flight attendant friends. Relax. Relax. I'm not joking. But very possible. Very godly flight attendants. They work. Anyway, so moving on. Um, a lot of them with Hawaiian Airlines. Anyway, moving right along. Godly. Yes, they, yes, they are. So now, when I see Sarah, you know Sarah who did the offering? Sarah, you should, do bed, you should do a podcast, Bedtime Stories with Sarah. So soothing. Can we give her a hand? What a beautiful voice. You had everybody's attention, Sarah. You had everybody's attention. And guess what? She's not on staff. She's not on staff. She is a homeschooling mom housewife for Jesus. That's what she is. I'm on the ramp for Jesus. I'm in the Navy for Jesus. Come on. I, I, I work for the city and county for Jesus. I'm a trucker for Jesus. I own a business for Jesus. When we begin to see that we are saints in the city, then we realize that we represent Jesus Christ, not necessarily inspire church, but the church at large, that we can make a difference in the city, in Nanakuli, in Kailua, and everything in between in the name of Jesus. Somebody say amen. But before we can even get in more into the series, um, we have to talk about one thing that I think is probably the most fundamental baseline thing that we should before we, you know, take our faith into the city. We take it, and as we go, there's something I want us to realize. Number one, Jesus calls us the body through the Apostle Paul, right? That's us. We are the body. Some of us are hands. Some of us are eyes. Some of us are spleens. Some of us are, you, you, never mind. You know what I mean? Try to live without a spleen. I don't know. I haven't, but anyway, it's okay. And then, and then he also calls us the bride. Okay, so men, let's get rid of our masculine mindset on this one. Keep it, but let it work through it. Because when we are the bride of Christ, 
As a matter of fact, there is a marriage supper of the Lamb, which is Jesus, and the bride, and that will take place in heaven. That's us. We are the bride of Christ. And so he calls us the body, and then he calls us the bride. If he calls us the bride, then who is the groom? His name is Jesus, right? Jesus. Jesus is the groom, and the church is the bride. So when I ask you to open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5, there was a purpose for that, because when we look at this, there's a metaphor that the Apostle Paul uses that is totally given by God about the bride of Christ, and that has a lot to do with what is and who is the bride. When I do weddings, and I, do, I don't do as many weddings as I used to before, but when I do them, um, I would always say to the marriage coordinator like Jocelyn Kimura, I said, Jocelyn, can you do me a favor? Can Jocelyn, wave your hand, wave your hand. Okay, jo Jocelyn, she doesn't have her own business, but, you know, but she should. But anyway, Jocelyn will contact the bride and the groom, and she will give them the scriptures that I will be reading, okay? Because I don't want any confusion up front. I don't want somebody going, wait, hold on, I'm not, no, I don't want that passage. I said, no, I want that passage. I'm preaching. I know you're waiting, but I'm, I'm, I'm sharing, okay? Don't give me your favorite verse. No, <laughs> just kidding. It's all about you, but I'm preaching, okay? So anyway, so it's all about you. It's not about me, but, uh, and so I will go through Ephesians chapter 5, and then I will invariably get these responses um, every now and then. If I know that a young lady has read this text of passage and she understands it, she's fine. But it's there every now and then, it'll happen where they're like, whoa, whoa okay, so you, you see the, well, oh, you know, anyway, so here, let's read it. So Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, and the Bible says, and further, you will both submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, okay? So it call, God calls for mutual submission. Don't, don't worry, I'm talking about the church. I'm not just talking about your, your marriage, my marriage, I'm talking about the church, okay? All right, so now, it says this, oh, you guys quiet today. You got to help me out. Anyway, moving right along. It says that further you will submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. I tell them that there's mutual submission. I submit to Lisa. I mean, she doesn't, I'm, I'm still the head of the house, but I, I will submit. I will submit to her decision on where we're going to eat tonight. I will submit to her decision on finances when we don't agree and we have to come to an agreement. I will submit sometimes to her, uh, her ideas, even though I think it's not going to work. Um, <laughs> Some battles are worth fighting, and some are not. And then some are worth saying, I told you so. But anyway, <laughs> further, you will submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So I submit to her, she submits to me. That's the foundation. Can I get an amen? That's the foundation. Then it goes on to say, and for the wives, and this is where sometimes it happens, it says, and for wives, this means submit to your husbands as you would to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife, as Christ is the head of the church. Now, Lisa and I are equal partners, but in function, at the end of the day, I'm, I, I'm the head. The, Jesus said I'm the head. But it also says, wives, submit to your husband. So submission, let me make it clear. For all you checking out or whatever you're thinking, like, oh, my gosh, this is okay. So I understand. Submission really means to honor and to respect. Just honor and respect your husband. Honor him and respect him. The way you speak to him, the way, and he should honor and respect you too, no doubt about it. Okay? But at the end of the day, he's the head. So when we think about this honor, love, and respect, this is important. I've had, I've had young ladies flinch during the wedding because, you, Justin, you never tell them. I'm using this. Like, I can see the eyes go. <laughs> I'm like, oh, boy. And, and then I got to clarify. It means to honor and to respect for the whole, everybody in the house. It's honor and to respect in the, at the wedding. I'm telling them it's honor and respect. Everybody's like, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> And then it says, for why the husband, the, he is the, the savior of his body, the church, as the church submits to Christ. So you wives submit to husbands and everything. And every time I said, are you willing, I do this. I said, are you willing to do this? And she will say, yes, because she has been prepped. She has been prepared. She knows, like, no, you didn't lose your individuality. You didn't, you, you didn't, you, you didn't lose all, all that. You still got all that. You still all got that attitude. You still all got that. You got all that. But you still will be able to do that by loving and honoring and respecting your husband. And she says, I will. And I make a big deal about it. I go, hallelujah. <laughs> and then the, the groom is laughing. He's like, <laughs> I said, wait, we're not done with you. We're just getting started. <laughs> we're just getting started. And then I go to Ephesians chapter, I go to verse 20, 25, and I say, for husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. Wow, okay, okay, let, let's, 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 let's break that down. How much did he love the church? He, remember now, she's a bride. He gave his life up for her. 
He stretched out his arms. He died for her. He, he gave his life for her. Then it says this. He gave up his life for her. There it says right there in verse 25, to make her holy and clean and washed by the cleansing of God's word. I asked him, can you love her like that? Can you love her like that? And, 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 and I said, because there's three words. There's the first word is eros, and that's that physical attraction. That's when you saw her, she saw you, said, hey, bae. <laughs> that's that physical attraction at the very beginning. That's eros. And then there's phileo, and you worked on your phileo, which is your friendship. Phileo, P-H-I-L-E-O. That's the word Philadelphia, okay? Not phileo fish. And then, <laughs> said, right? And then we worked on the eros. We got the phileo. And how are you doing on the agape? The agape, the, the self-sacrificing, it's all about you, it's not about me. It's like I want to serve you, I want to love you. It, it, it's, it's through the hard times, through the bad times, through the good times. I, we, we hope we, hopefully we got more good times than tough times. How, 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 can you do that? Can you do that? And you know what? Most guys, they're hitting up, they're thinking arrows. <laughs> I can love you like that. <laughs> I can love you like that. Yeah, you're thinking arrows. I'm asking you, can you agape? Because why? Because Jesus loves us with an agape love. It's a self-sacrificing love. And then it says this, and this is what I wanted to get to. He says, he did this to present her to himself as a glorious church. This is the bride, as a glorious church, with instead, without stain, wrinkle, or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. This is the church. The picture of the church. The bride of Christ. Are you with me? It's not, the, the church is the bride. I've done a lot of weddings in my day. Never seen a bad bride. Never seen a bad bride. Seen some interesting weddings, though. <laughs> I've seen a bride show up an hour half late. An hour half late. I was ready to leave. I've seen, <laughs> stop it. I, <laughs> stop it, Micah. I've seen great weddings. I've seen awesome weddings. I, I, everyone that I got the privilege and honor of being a part of, it's been awesome. But I can tell you that on Wednesday, she had her nails done. I can tell you on Thursday, she had her face show. I can tell you on Friday, she got her lashes. I can tell you on Saturday, she got massaged. I can tell you on Saturday afternoon, she put on her dress, and nobody care about the groom. I can tell you that she had it all worked out. I can tell you that a, a big, a big to-do has been made about what she was going to wear and who was going to coordinate. I can tell you all of these things because I've been to a, done a lot of weddings, and they have been awesome. But I can tell you this, that the groom, when the groom walks in, no, nobody stands up. Nobody stands up when the groom comes in. And I can tell you that I've seen, I've seen flower girls who are nieces, sometimes two, sometimes three, sometimes overdone. And I've seen them walk down, and I smile the whole time because it's awesome. I've seen ring bearer boys come up there with their little thing, somebody's nephew with his nice fresh cut, you know what I'm talking about, and his little tuxedo. I've seen that. I, I, I've seen a lot of those. I've seen that. Then I've seen bridesmaids, oh, too many bridesmaids. Maids. I've seen like seven bridesmaids, ten bridesmaids. Keep it simple, sisters. That's all I want to say. <laughs> Save your dad some money, ladies. Save your father money. I've seen that. I've seen it all. I've seen bridesmaids that made it all. Bridesmaids that made it all about them. All about them. Not the bride. All about them. I've seen that. You can pick them. Pick them easy. Pick them easy. Easy. I've been to a lot of weddings, done a lot of weddings. And then I've seen all of a sudden, there's a pause in the music, and then I have seen the whole people of the congregation rise to their feet, and the music transition, and there she is, that beautiful lady, young, middle-aged, doesn't matter, she is beautiful in all her glory, all her mani petties, all her smooth skin. She got leftover sugar on her arms. I don't know what they do with that sugar. I don't know what they do with the sugar. I, 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 I don't know. I don't know. And, I, I, and I'm telling telling you, she is walking down that aisle, and ev everybody is crying. They are amazed, and his jaw is like this, because <laughs> he cannot believe what he's seeing. He's amazed, and she walks down in all her glory, in all her beauty, in all her splendor on that day, and on that day, she is ceremonially perfect, ceremonially perfect, perfect that day, perfect. Consummation, vows, banquet, tears, laughter, hugs, selfies. 
toasting. Beautiful day. Ceremonially at her best. On Monday, this comes off. <laughs> On Monday, On Monday, it's a different story. <laughs> Baggy shorts, ripped t-shirt, <laughs> loose, just enjoying life. Like, I'm, I don't get that stuff off me. Without stain, without wrinkle, or any other blemish, ceremonially perfect. That's what the church will be one day. That's the church where we meet Jesus in the air. That's the church on Sunday. What I just described is the church on Monday. Roll up the sleeves, change clothes, brush teeth, go to work. That's the church on Monday. What I, what, what I just read is the church on Sunday. Is the church with the marriage feast of the supper of the Lamb. That's the church in glory. This is the church on Monday and Tuesday, and Wednesday, and that's the saints on Monday, on Tuesday, on Friday. That's me and you. So here it is, real quick, with the time that I've got left, and I've got some time, so don't look at the clock. Don't even look. Don't even turn around this side. They all look up. They're going, how much time he got? How much time he got? I got plenty of time. So here it is. Here it is. If we are the bride, number one, as we love Jesus, we love the bride. As we love Jesus, we love the bride. So you cannot love Jesus but not love the bride. It's hard to do. I mean, it's hard to separate the two, but it can be easy to do. It can be easy to do. And so what we see is, number one, is we look as we love Jesus, we love the bride. Yeah, we got to agape the bride. We got to love the bride. We, we, the bride of Christ, the, without stain, wrinkle, or any other blemish. Yeah, the, the, the bride's got some stains. The bride's got some wrinkles. The bride's got some blemishes. The bride is fine. It's going to be okay. And, and, and the bride has taken some shots on the chin in the last few years, longer than two. Uh, it has sullied its reputation at times in different pockets. It has failed in several ways. I think it has. But we still love the bride. We still love the bride. We love the bride because the bride is not perfect. The bride is being perfected. God is perfecting the bride. God is dealing with the bride sometimes. He loves the bride. He loves it so much. He will never leave the bride. He will never abandon the bride. The bride is the church, everybody. He will never do that. And I think what God wants us to do is realize that before we can go be saints in the city, as we are saints in the city, we got to love the bride. I know I'm preaching to the choir, Honolulu. Mililani, Waikele, you're all in the building. But I want you to know this. That John chapter 13, verse 34 to 35, Jesus said this. He said, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Your love for one another. Right? Not, 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 not the issue. Oh, that's important. Or not your stance. That's important. Your voice, your platform, all of that stuff. That's important. But you're not going to be known by that. You'll be put into a category or a demographic by that or an algorithm by that. What you will be known for is your love for Jesus and your love for one another. Yeah. Because, mm. so think about this. As we love the bride, we, we love Jesus. Here's number two. Number two, when we love Jesus, we serve the bride. When we love Jesus, we serve the bride. We don't use the bride. We serve the bride. We're, and and you know, this is where the last act before Jesus goes to the cross is to show his disciples love. And what does he do? He washes their feet. Okay? This is not like washing feet today. Washing feet today, you got socks on. You got shoes on. Okay? But back then, it was dusty. It was hot. It was sweaty. Washing of the feet was the lowest servant's job. The lowest servant in the house. That was their job, was to wash the feet. The youngest one. The one without seniority, it was their job to wash the feet of all the guests that would come in because to get all that, just that dust and that sweat from the, from the, from the calf down and wash it, wipe it down with towels, fresh feet. You know what I'm talking about? Fresh and clean feet, not fresh feet. Anyway, fresh and clean feet. It was their job. 
Jesus' last act was to serve his disciples before he went to the cross. So when we love Jesus, we serve the bride. I've been married for, Lisa and I have been married for 28 years. And 28 years ago, when we walked down the aisle at Moana Lua Gardens Missionary Church, the church that Pastor Kelchinen handed off to his son, when we got married there 28 years ago, it was awesome. I remember Pastor Ralph telling me, he says, Mike, if you keep loving her, the way, washing her with the word, she will become more beautiful every year. And you know what? There are people who come up to me, and they'll say to me, or in front of me, they'll say, oh, Mike, your wife is so beautiful. And I say, well, thank you. Thank you very much. I said, honey, you're welcome. <laughs> You're welcome. You know why? I take credit for that because I love her, and I wash her with the word. And, 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 and if so happens that the timing is right, and if something might happen perhaps that enchanted evening, just be beating around the bush because we have teenagers in the house, and if it's possible that something romantic might take place, and I'm planning for the evening, so what do I do? I tell her, baby, go sleep, take a nap. I got this. I'll do the dishes. That's agape love. I hate doing dishes. <laughs> I'll fold clothes. I'll fold clothes. I don't like folding clothes. I hate folding clothes. I, I detest folding clothes. You know, I have three daughters. You know, everything's small, and then they take my stuff. I got to put initials on my socks. <laughs> initials, MK, on my white socks, so they don't take them. I stood them on my white socks. I don't like doing this. But I do this. Because I love her and because hopefully something um, happens. And so, <laughs> why am I telling you this? Um, because I, 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 I love her. I love her. And I just want to make sure. I just want to make sure. And people say, Mike, w w great job. You've been loving your wife. Hey, it's, I've, I've been married to Lisa for the last 28 years. And his has been the best 28 years <laughs> of Lisa's life. Say it again. Come on, tell the truth and shame the devil right now. <laughs> tell the truth and shame the devil. So anyway, the church is being washed. The bride is being washed with the word. When we open the word of God, we're washing the church. We are presenting her to himself without stain, wrinkle, or any other blemish. But I, let's be honest, that there have been stains and there have been wrinkles and there have been blemishes. And it happens. Because what you have is you have leadership that is still flesh and blood being run by the Spirit of God, hopefully. And in the 20 years that I've pastored, and there have been people who have left our church, and no doubt about it, it was just we moved or we just, we, we, we kind of like this pastor, but it's okay, fine, totally good. We're all in the flock together. Everybody's still saved, hallelujah. And you know what? And then there, there are people who come to our church. And there are times they're like, we, we just wanted to hear what you wanted, what you guys were doing, and we just want. But there are times that people have come and they have been hurt. They have been mishandled or mistreated or something has not gone well. And what Lisa and I do is we don't judge it. We don't judge the other pastor or the other church because we realize that those things are going to happen sometimes and it's very sad and it's unfortunate, but sometimes it is what it is. So we, our standard practice is not to listen to it all. Just keep it right there. We don't need to know the details. Welcome. We love you. Hopefully you could fix that if you need to. But I want you to know this, that we love you. And so on behalf of them and even us, would you please forgive us? Would you please forgive them? And there are times we're often met with tears in their eyes, and they're like, wow, nobody's ever done that before. Because I understand you don't want to separate yourself from the bride. You don't want to say, I love Jesus, but I don't love his bride. And so for you to come back tells me that you, you love Jesus and you want to know, can you trust this bride again? And so we receive that and we do that. And then there are times, because there are times that I can tell, sometimes I don't know, but sometimes I can tell that maybe you had heavy-handed leadership or maybe it was too legalistic. Maybe it was it, it, it just they handled the situation wrong and, and it was one too many times. I understand that. I hope you were able to stick it out as long as you can, that you don't, you don't bounce so easily. You know what I'm saying? Oh, I'm mad at him. I'm offended. I'm bouncing again. And then before you know it, you bounce, 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 bounce. Within three years, you've, t you've, you've gone to seven different places. You don't want to be like that because you won't grow. You don't want to be a potted plant that moves my pot, you know what I'm saying? You want to get planted in the house of the Lord. Then you will flourish. 
but first we have to deal with this, and is it possible that you have not given, like, like let's say like before you got married, you were dating, and your last fiancé or boyfriend or girlfriend before you married, the one that you are with now, had hurt you, stepped on your heart, felt mistreated, mishandled, didn't love you like you thought you should have been loved, and then now you are married, or before you get married, you can't give all your heart because of what brother did in the past or what sister did to you, and you, you, it prevents you from giving your whole heart. Well, you have to learn to love again. You have to learn to trust again because when you can love again and when you can trust again, when you can, then supernatural, powerful things happen in your life, Honolulu, Mililani, online, like you never thought could happen because now I will trust again. I want to ask you, can you trust this bride again? Can you trust this bride again? We are not perfect. In fact, if you find a perfect church, Leave because you might ruin it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> That's a joke. But it, there is no perfect church. We're all being perfected. It's like the bride. She was ceremonially at her best. One day, we'll meet, her in, meet him in the air. And it's going to be amazing. But right now, Taking, taking one on the chin, it's still standing, it's working out priorities, it's not being pulled in other directions, it's trying to remember why it is here still, it's the bride, it's the bride and she's beautiful, she is truly perfection, she's perfection, we are the bride of Christ, we're not perfect, but we're getting better every single year. In the name of Jesus. Number one is we love Jesus. We love the bride. Number two, when we love Jesus, we serve the bride. And the worship team can come up. And here's number three. Number three, as we love Jesus, we must be the bride. Men, wrap your mind around that. Yes, we are the bride. We are the bride of Christ. We are the bride. And then when we love the bride, we deal with the bride. We are the bride. And this is how we end up becoming the saints in the city the saints in the city. Because when we begin to understand the power of what it means to say, I'm a pilot for Jesus. I am a doctor. I'm a physician's assistant for Jesus. I am an educator in the state school system for Jesus. What does that mean? That means you pray over your classroom every single day before you even, the kids even arrive. That means you've got the list of all of the children's names because you realize the learning challenges that they've had lately. When you realize what is going on at home and you're praying for their moms and their dads, not just for them, that's what it means to be a teacher, an educator, no matter what school system, for Jesus. When you are a coffee shop owner or when you own a clothing company, for Jesus, you realize that people are going to actually be putting your threads on. And so you pray over every garment and you ask God to bless the wearer of that shirt. That when they use it, something happens to them somehow, some way. You pray over that. When you drive the vehicle or you hand off the Uber or the Turo car to someone who's going to get it from you, you already have cleansed that car with <laughs> alcohol and whatever, but you've also prayed and sprayed the love of Jesus in that car. When you are a student at the university or you are on an athletic team, you realize that your example of disappointment and your example of joy is going to be portrayed and is going to be projected, excuse me, to your friends who are on that team. When you are a soccer coach with the AYSO, don't take it too seriously like I did years ago, but realize that you're molding and shaping young boys and girls in the way that they think, in the way that they think without getting too religious. When you are in the Army and you are in the Navy, the Air Force, the Marine Corps, the Coast Guard, you have a commanding officer and you have to obey his orders and you must show that respect. But ultimately behind that office and behind that man 
is your commander in chief of the Lords of Heaven's armies, and his name is Jesus. We realize that I am a janitor for Jesus. I just, you're not just a janitor for Jesus. You are not just a housewife for Jesus. You're not just a retiree for Jesus. You are more than that. You are a saint in the city, placed by God for such a time as this. For the most confusing, perplexing times of our life. You seen the gas prices? There's a fix for that. You get one running right through America. Just tap that thing and prices come down. Anyway, just, just let me move on. Did I, did I, did, anyway, I just popped my head up on that one and I'm put it back under. Think about that for a moment. The church is the hope of the world. The gathering of the saints is critical. Brothers and sisters can't do this in other parts of the world. Underground is where they go. They can't gather, and they are growing when they can't gather. But they wish they could gather like me and you. When, they, when we equip the saints, the people of God come together, watch what happens. Jesus is our hope. The Holy Spirit is our help. Noah, he saw the church as an ark of safety. Abraham, he saw the church as a great nation through which the world would be blessed. Jacob saw the church as the house of God, a family and a gateway to heaven. Moses saw the church as a place of freedom from slavery. Joshua saw the church as a promised land worth fighting for. David saw the church as a magnificent place for God's fame to be proclaimed throughout the earth. A place to be preferred, not endured. A place of great celebration. Isaiah saw the church as the greatest attraction on the planet called earth and the fountainhead of truth to the world. Ezekiel saw the church as a place where dead bones come alive. Dry bones come alive. Jesus saw the church as his bride and his body. Uh, Paul saw the church as glorious, victorious, worthy of giving all for it to advance and therefore to take care of it. And, and, after, and the apostle John on the island of Patmos gets a revelation from God, a download from God for the book of Revelation. Saw a vision where the church was an eternal city. Uh, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. And now more than ever, the church is essential. The church is his bride. The church is eternal. And imagine what God can do with a church like this for such a time as this. Come on, would you stand to your feet and give praise to God right now? Give, stand to your feet and give Him the praise for the bride. Lord, we thank You for the bride and we thank You for the body. We love You, Lord. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Don't, don't leave yet. Stay right, stay, stand, stay standing to your feet. Watch this. Consider this. I have known that I wanted to do this from the other day. And I did it last night, and I did it at the last service, and, and, and I want to do this. I want to do a quick, quick moment with you. You have not given your all, some, because you've been hurt. And I asked you to trust the bride again. And I think you need to release forgiveness if that would be you. That I've been hurt by heavy-handed I've been hurt by legalism. I've been hurt by gossip, and I've been hurt. And Lord, keep that away from us too, Lord. And if we've done that, please forgive us. And you're testing, and you're sitting with a little bit of indifference like this for too long. And unless you forgive, we can't receive all that God has for folded arms rather than open hands. So on behalf of Lisa and I, an inspire, we ask on behalf of, like I've been here 20 years, on behalf of brothers and sisters who meant well have done wrong, on behalf of a sinister plan of the enemy to derail you by violating some principles in your life, on behalf of anyone from the mainland, any, any leader, any shepherd, kahu, doesn't matter, pastor, you have to forgive, you should forgive. And on behalf of them, I am asking, would you please forgive us? Would you please forgive us for the times that we've dropped the ball, times that we could have done better? 
times that we've, there's been spots and wrinkles and blemishes. Would you please forgive us? I ask, would you forgive him? I ask, would you forgive her? I ask that person in your mind right now, would you just release them and release you in the process and forgive? If that's you, would we all say it together? It says, we forgive the bride. Would you say it with me on the count of three? One, two, three. We forgive the bride. Powerful moment right there. Powerful moment. Powerful moment right there. And now, if you've been holding back, if you have not trusted and if you have not really availed yourself to the plans and the people of God because of that withholding, then would we all say, Lord, please forgive us. Say it with me if you feel it. Lord, would you please forgive us for holding back our love and affection, our respect and our honor that the bride deserves. I can't separate the two, but I thank you that the bride is being perfected. And so help me too. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen, amen. Stay standing for a few moments. And if you've never given your life to Jesus, you would become a part of the body of Christ. You would become part of the bride of Christ. And if you've never given your life to Jesus, this is a very important moment that I'm really big on rededications lately. Because I think the last two years and everything else that has gone on and pile it all on, people have kind of fallen back and they're coming back to church. And they want to come back to the house of God. They want the fountain of truth. They want truth to be spoken, and so they're coming to church. And if you've never, and if you've, you feel like you need to rededicate your life to Christ, and let's do it. This is it. This is the place. This is the moment. And if you'd like to give your life to Jesus for the very first time, I want you to know that he brought you here because he loves you. Because why? Because John 3, 16 tells us God so loved the world that he gave his one, one and only son to us to die on the cross for us, that whoever believes in him, will not perish but have everlasting life. He loves every single one of you, every single one of us, you, every one of us. And He drew you here because He loves you. He knew that you would hear the Word of God and he would, be, he would be speaking to you just differently than everybody else. And we're not all getting the same message. We're getting the message from God and it's different and He's downloading to you and He loves you. He doesn't want you to leave this place. He doesn't want you to wait for last rites. Don't wait for last rites. You may never get a last right. Take your first rights. Your first rights right now. Surrender your life to Jesus and make Him your Lord and your Savior. And I promise you, it won't be easy, but it will be worth it. Would you close your eyes and bow your heads with me, please? If that's you, from my right side, on the Eva side, to the Diamond Head side, to the Malka side on the top, and everybody in between, no matter who you are, where you've been, what you've done, what philosophy you had, what hurts you brought in, God loves, He loves you. Bring them all. Bring them all to Him. Lay it at the feet of Jesus. But you got to lay it at the feet of Jesus so you can open up your arms to receive what He has. If that's you, that you want to rededicate your life to Jesus today. If that's you, that you want to be a first time, you want, you want to surrender your life to Jesus. You want to invite Him into your life. You want the forgiveness of sins, the gift of eternal life in heaven. You want to, you want to follow in a different direction that you were walking in. And you want to make a change right now, a big change. Massive change, but he's going to help you transform you. If that's you, from the front, back, left, right, online, in person, the top at the bottom, don't worry. We're not going to ask you to do anything crazy like come down to the front. One day we will, but this is not the day. But let me ask you right now, if you are ready to give your life to Jesus at the count of three, I want you to raise your hand when I clap at the count of three. So get ready to raise it. Here we go. One. Come on. Loves you so much. Two. Here we go. Get ready to raise it. Here we go. One, two, three. Put your hand up right here. Put your hand up right now. That's you. You want Jesus in your heart. Jesus in your life. Keep them up. Keep them up. Keep them up. One right there. Two right there. God bless you. Anybody? Rededications? Three, four. Amen. First time this season. Five right there. God bless you. And six right there. God bless you. Anybody else? First time rededications? All of it. Seven, eight, nine, ten. God bless you. Anyone? Anyone else? Eleven right here. I saw you. Twelve right there. God bless you. Anybody else on my right? Fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Amen. Anybody else on the top? Anybody else in the middle top? Anybody else? Wave at me if I miss you. If you 
you are in the shadow, wave at me on the top. Anybody else? 17 right there. Anybody else? God bless you. Anybody else in overflow? Please let us know. Come on. I want everybody right now to repeat this prayer after me. Together, let's say this and reaffirm our faith for many and first time for a few. So let's pray. Father, we come before you. Oh, sorry. Okay. Say, oh, sorry. Say, Jesus. <laughs> Thank you for loving me before I first loved you and dying on the cross, shedding your blood that washes my sins as white as snow. I thank you for heaven. I thank you for your eternity. But while I'm here, be my strength for today and my hope for tomorrow. Teach me. Lead me. Use me. Guide me. Heal me, shape me, mold me into the image of Jesus from this day forward. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said, Amen. Come on, everybody, let's thank the Lord.